Good afternoon, everyone. A special welcome to all of our guests today. Jesus made a statement which, when his disciples heard the first words coming out of his mouth, it would have been interesting to know what they would have said to complete the statement. You know, we've read it, of course, many times, and we know what he meant, but as he was beginning to say it, if he had paused after he said this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If he had then paused to take a breath, what do you suppose, if you had been there at the time and you had never heard him complete that statement, what do you suppose he would have said? What would he have filled in that blank with? Or what, do you, what would you have filled in that blank with had you been one of the disciples that was sitting there and listening to it? Would you have thought, well, let's see. We know that the Sabbath is that great sign between God and his people, and therefore he certainly would expect us to keep the Sabbath day. To be sure, Jesus made certain statements that he had already about doing what he told us to do, about keeping his commandments, about being obedient you know, to his law and be obedient to his words. We also know that he has said elsewhere that one of the things involving the love of God was keeping the commandments. And so it would have been a very simple matter, uh, almost logical, for these men sitting there to say, well, he's going to say, keep the commandments, observe the Sabbath, be obedient to God. But oddly enough, they may not have thought of that that way for this reason. In their world, most people kept the commandments. At least they gave lip service to it, and an awful lot of them did quite well by keeping the commandments. The Sabbath day was observed by nearly everyone in sight. You know, it was the only day in this particular world that anybody observed. There was no conflict in that particular thing, so that probably would not have crossed their minds. The fact is that keeping the commandments is something they, they and their fathers and their grandfathers and their brothers and their sisters, they've grown up believing all of their life about keeping the commandments. But notice Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, as opposed to somebody else's disciples, even within the religion of your fathers. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's the way he finished it. So the thing that was to distinguish Jesus' disciples out of a large group of commandment-keeping people was the fact that they loved one another. The problem with this is, though, that love is one of the most misunderstood and misused words in any language. I almost said in the English language, but I don't think that that's true. I think it is probably true in any language. I mean, we, we say that we love uh, strawberry ice cream. We love fireworks on the 4th of July. You know, we love our dogs. We love our cats. We love our neighbor's wife. And we love God. Not necessarily, of course, in that order. But the fact is that people use the same word for the way they feel about a pet that they would use for the way they feel about God. So obviously, there's a problem, isn't there, with the word love? And we need to understand that uh, we tend to lose track sometimes of what words mean. We use them so freely, and they, they change their meaning sometimes. The indications are that the word love has always been misunderstood, and it's oftentimes been a problem in various languages. Remember when Jesus, after his resurrection, had met with his disciples, and he sat down, he looked Peter in the eye and said, Peter... Simon, Peter, do you love me? And Peter came back and said, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, now, in the first place, there was a little problem with what that word meant to Peter and to Jesus. In the second place, there was a problem with what the words involved meant to the King James translators because for some reason, which is difficult to fathom, they looked at two different Greek words in that conversation. Jesus used one word for love, Peter used an entirely different word for love, but the King James translators just said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said back, Lord, you know that I love you. But Jesus said, agape. Peter said, phileo. The difference being, do you love me? And Peter responded, well, Lord, you know that I have a great deal of affection for you. Peter sidestepped that word, agape. 
And so they went on in the conversation, and that story is well known and has been told elsewhere at great length. But let's go back to the King James translators again, who as they made their way through the Bible, having dealt with Peter and, and, and Jesus in this sense, and have translated two very different words as love, they then came to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now here they are up against a peculiar problem. And really, the existence of this chapter in the Bible tells us, I think, that the word love in the first century, the word agape, had probably been misused about as much as love has been misused in our language, and that consequently Paul found it necessary to define it at great length for the Corinthians and to go through all sorts of explanations about what the word meant. Well, the King James translators, when they came to this particular chapter, for some strange reason, did not use the word love which they had previously used for agape and phileo, now they come to agape, and they don't use it at all. Because as they began to make their way through this, they began to understand, I think, that the word love is so often misunderstood and so often misused, they were looking around for some way of conveying the meaning of the word or some additional meaning of the word that would be in line with what Paul is saying here. And they chose the word charity. It's a good word, and I think probably it was a better word in their day than it is in our day. I think in their day it was probably a great deal closer to the meaning of the word agape, which basically has to do with a selfless, generous, giving spirit, outgoing spirit of giving to another person, or of giving of yourself, of giving of your things, a sharing, generous approach to life. They chose charity. Well, as language will, good, will do, charity over the years has come to mean almost any kind of giving to a worthy cause. Uh, it can even boil down to things like bingo drives and uh, rummage sales, which have nothing to do really with so much with giving, uh, because people go there to buy things. People, I guess, give things to be sold. But in church, one church uh, I heard of, there was a situation where fairly well-to-do women were, were uh, making donations of clothes to the church uh, uh, used clothing fund for the poor. But some of them were designer clothes and awfully nice clothes and only been worn a couple of times. And so other ladies in the church were coming in and buying them out of that fund and giving the money into the fund as a result of it so they could go out and wear the clothes themselves some more. So funny things happen with, with giving and with charity. And nowadays in our world, charities, uh, I don't think it means the same thing anymore. And so if they were translating it today, they'd be stuck with another problem. And probably... Even in our language, the best word for what is going on here is love, but still, there is a problem. Charity has to do with giving, but I want you to consider something here that maybe you haven't thought of before. In verse 3, he makes an interesting statement. He says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity... Agape, it profits me nothing. Do you, run, do you realize what you just read here? Now, I have heard uh, it said before that love is the way of give as opposed to the way of get. You know, that one of the ways you define love that is an attitude of giving. But read, read it again here. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, is that giving? Of course it is. It's a very high level of giving, isn't it? And have not love, it profits me nothing. In other words, sacrificial giving can be done without love, without agape. How does that work? Well, let me see. Let's suppose that you live in a neighborhood, in a city, and the neighborhood in which you live is a neighborhood which is somewhat disadvantaged, and in, this, in the uh, circumstance or the, the course of events, it has turned out that it, it happens to be the place where an awful lot of homeless people tend to gather for one reason or another, maybe because there are more grapes that they can sleep on where there is heat in them, but there tend to be a number of homeless people who tend to congregate into your neighborhood. And you run a small ethnic restaurant in this neighborhood, and you've got a pretty good little business going there and have been there for many years. One day some people come by your business looking for a donation to charity. The charity that they are working on is to put in a little, not a mission as such, but a shelter and a place for food to be served 
to these people who are street people. They can come in, they can get out of the cold, they can have a warm meal uh, and, and a place to be sheltered from the wind, maybe for the night, maybe sleep over or something like that. And they want you to donate to this. Now, immediately your mind goes into gear on this and you start thinking about it. There happens to be, right next door to your place of business, a, 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 an abandoned building, an abandoned business, and, and, a, and a storefront place, type place, which would be almost ideal for what these people have in mind. But if they put this soup kitchen in right next door to your restaurant, it could adversely affect your business. Obviously, you would very much like to see that soup kitchen put in, if at all, someplace else, because it's going to pose a problem for you. You know, maybe why should somebody come in and eat with your restaurant and go next door and get fed free? No, that's not the real reason. The real reason you just don't want these bums hanging around the sidewalk right outside of your business. So you decide to make an extremely generous donation to this particular cause. You actually may may give them some money, and you say, I will give you $20,000. Nobody else has given you that much. On condition that you keep this soup kitchen away at least two blocks or three blocks or four blocks or five, what do you can get away with, away from this location. Have you committed an act of agape? You have given, haven't you? You've given quite generously. But you see, there is no spiritual value in that. Even if you went down, you know, a few blocks away and you bought a building and you donated the building and you did it so they wouldn't be next door to you. See, your gift has had all sorts of strings hanging on it. It is not really given in that way. And the reward that you get, you will get a reward, by the way, for this. The reward is that the soup kitchen will not be located next to your restaurant. But you see, your reward is not spiritual. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with Christianity at all. It has to do with your own welfare. In 1 Corinthians 13, going a little further, it makes another statement in verse 5. Love seeks not her own. In other words, love does not have its own interests involved in giving. Giving in love is giving with no strings attached. And in fact, one of the definitions, and probably something that we really need to have firmly in our mind regarding love in any form, in any shape, and in any application we may ever want to think about, is love has no strings attached. It is not conditional. It isn't uh, uh, partial. And of course, this is a great deal of what he's trying to tell us here is that love just isn't that way. It is open. It is free. It is, in a word, generous. Our word generous is kind of an interesting word, by the way. It comes from a Latin expression which means of noble birth. And it says that a generous act is a noble act. Not selfish, not self-oriented, not for gain, not somehow to make yourself better, not to protect yourself, not to ingratiate yourself but it's giving for the sake of giving to another person purely, no strings attached. Now, do you remember a statement that Jesus made? He said, Give to him that asks you, and from him that would borrow of you, don't turn away. You know, that's a troubling scripture. Matthew 5.42, if you want to look up the exact words and remind yourself, that's a troubling scripture. Because it almost implies that if someone comes up to you and, and, and says, I, I need to borrow some money, I need to borrow this from you or borrow that from you, that you're supposed to give it to him without even asking any questions. I had a funny thing happen to me just the other day. I ran into a fellow who I happen to know who he is. I do not even know his name. He actually uh, uh, lives at the marina where I oftentimes launch my boat. And uh, he, for, in order for, to, uh, in exchange for living there, he collects uh, some of the rents and so forth for the fellow there, and he gets to keep, in exchange for some of his work, the boat launch fees. You know, $3 I give him to launch my boat there. He gets to keep, put that in his pocket and keep it. Well, I ran into him. I said, he's, he's, he lives on a, a pretty low income, I'm sure. He lives on his boat, his sailboat out there in, in the marina. And uh, I happened to run into him going into a store downtown the other day, and he said, Ron. I said, yeah. 
He said, well, hello there. We shook hands. He said, I'm embarrassed. I'm terribly embarrassed. He said, I got in town. My car is broke down. And I was wondering if you could lend me $20 until next time you come out the lake. And I was so embarrassed because I didn't even have the $20. You know, I was down to, you know, just a few of my own. I hadn't gone to the bank. And he hadn't gone to the bank. We're both the same. All right, so I, ha- I, I had to turn him down. He said, well, could you give me a ride? And I said, sure. So he, he waited a few minutes while I took care of some business. And I took him way around a loop over there somewhere to drop him off at where he was. But, you know, I got to thinking about it. I think, really, you know, I, I had no choice. If I had had the $20 the man needed, I would have had to given it to him. And I had no choice when him, with him in trouble and his truck was broke down and he had to get over there where he could get, get something done. I had no choice but to take him over there. Jesus said to us, you know, from him that would borrow of you, turn not away. Give to him that asks. And what somebody may be asking of you sometimes may be $20. It may be some of your time. It may be a little bit of your gas. It may be the use of something that belongs to you. And the spirit that we are supposed to have is one that you hardly even think about it you know, we have to grow to this, but ha- hardly even think about it, but you dive into your wallet and say, sure, and you give to him that asks of you. And from him that would borrow from you, you do not turn away. Now, I've thought about that a lot of times in my life. I, around Tyler, you don't run into this very much, but in cities you do, where you're walking along the street and someone comes up and asks if you could spare a, a it used to be a dime for a cup of coffee, but not anymore. It's, uh, you know... 50 cents to a dollar for a cup of coffee, depending on where it is. But people will come and, and ask you. And it's always a troublesome thing as to, well, he's a wino, and I know if I give him any money, he's, he's going to go, go uh, spend it on, on booze. He's not going to buy a cup of coffee. He's not going to get a, if I give him $2, go buy himself a sandwich or a Big Mac, he's not going to do that. He's going to go buy a bottle of Thunderbird with that. And he'll, he and his friends will be, you know, belly up here before long, uh, having consumed that bottle of wine. Uh, and so you, you sort of struggle with yourself when you come into that kind of a situation. Jesus basically tells us that we're not supposed to have to struggle with ourselves like that. That our attitude as a, a generous one, an open-handed one, should be to give. So what if a man asks for it for a sandwich and goes and buys wine? That's no, no hurt to you. He told you he needed it for food. You gave it to him for food. You have responded as a Christian would. It's not your fault. I have known people who actually took such a person like that in hand and walked into a place with him and bought him something to eat. And I think that is a tremendous thing for a person to do. For the person here cares enough, not because the money is important. Generally speaking, people who are doing this sort of thing are not people who have to worry about a dollar or two dollars or three dollars that they're giving to this person. But they realize, I have to give a little bit more. I have to be sure if I really care about this person that he gets some food in his belly because he's in bad shape. So they care enough to actually take the person to a place and buy him something to eat. Now, Jesus made these statements, and it's a, it's a teaching that is so central to the Bible, so fundamental, uh, that, that, and so critical that we understand it, that we, we look at it here, we find it in the Old Testament, we find it in the New Testament, It is emphasized again and again and again because it is right here at this fundamental human level that love is most easily learned. Because, you see, virtually everything we do in the Christian religion has to do with interactions with other people. We don't get to interact directly very much with God. Oh, we pray and we study the Bible and all that interaction is there, but... but, but there's not any touching, you know, and there's not much seeing, and there's not, you don't hear God's voice falling on your ears. And you don't ever get a chance, really, to do much good to God, do you? He does good to you, but you hardly ever get a chance to do good directly to God. So consequently, when he starts teaching love, and when he starts teaching generosity to us, he starts at the most grassroots, the most fundamental level, the interactions that take place between us, right here and right now. And it would be wonderful if we could teach directly that people would be generous in their judgments of other people. Generous in judgment simply means you don't condemn and you don't criticize in your understanding and in your approach. That's hard to teach. But you know something that's not so hard to teach? It's generosity in your dealings with people where they have need that you can fulfill. It is simple. Even your children can grasp it and can deal with it, and it's the place where we begin to learn. 
Would you turn back with me to the uh, 24th chapter of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 24. I want to show you how God, just in the most earliest and fundamental ways in his, in his church, began to teach these lessons of people. Passed myself up there. Deuteronomy 24. He says, beginning down in verse uh, 10, when you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge. In other words, you're not even to allow yourself even a hint of being grasping in the process of helping or lending to a brother. You see, in the biblical economy, in God's way of doing things, it is wrong to, to obtain personal gain out of helping the poor. You are not allowed to make any kind of gain for yourself out of helping the poor. You are not even allowed to look like you want gain out of helping the poor. All right, you're going to lend him something. And he says, look, I want you to lend me so much money until night tonight or until tomorrow or until next day, until I get paid, I'm out of money. You're supposed to lend it to him. Yes, say, sure, here it is. And the guy says, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will give you my cloak as a pledge, and you can hold on to it, and when I get paid, I'll bring the money to you, and you can give me back my cloak. Now, it was allowed for a man to take that kind of a pledge for another man. But listen to what he says. You don't go into his house to, to get that pledge. If he says, come in, and I'll give it to you, he says, no, I'm not coming in. You know, he has to go in there and bring it out to you. You're to stand abroad, and the man whom you lend to shall bring out the pledge to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not sleep with his pledge. Isn't that something? You're not to even keep it with you overnight if he is poor. Now, if he's not a poor man, you know he's got two or three of whatever it is he's pledging with. It's no big deal. You're lending to him for some other reason. But if he's poor, you do not sleep with it. You shall deliver him the pledge again when the sun goes down, that he can sleep in his own raiment and bless you, and it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. You know, it's funny. What value is that pledge? Practically, nothing. It is really no, no more than symbolic. The man gives it to you when you give him the loan, but when the sun gets ready to go down because he sleeps in his cloak, you're supposed to take his cloak, go to his house and say, Here, you sleep in this tonight. I don't want you to sleep cold. Now, I think that is really kind of interesting uh, in the way that this commandment is given. A little earlier in this same chapter, it says in verse 6, No man shall take the nether or upper millstone to pledge, for he is taking a man's life. In other words, you are not allowed to take in pledge the things that a man uses to earn his living. I would stretch that out to say that it would be wrong if you were lending money to a brother in the church to take his tools with which he earns his living in pledge. Not only would it be wrong, it would be stupid. Stupid. Because that's where he's going to earn the money, to pay you back. But do you realize that so many forms of, of, of debt systems in the world are designed to keep people in debt? They are designed to keep them poor? They are designed to keep them paying and paying and paying and paying? You ever hear of a revolving charge account? That's what they're designed for. They're designed to keep you in debt. They're designed to keep you paying. They make a lot more money out of you. They're quite happy to have you keep adding things to that account and keep paying it off and adding and paying it off. It's the way they keep you poor. And God says, as a Christian, you're not supposed to do that to other people. You may get it done to you along the way, and I'm sorry if you do, but whatever you do, don't ever make that kind of a step yourself. Turn back to the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, where there's a bit more about this subject. As I said, these things are given right down at the grassroots, most fundamental level of human interaction to teach us generosity, to teach us what love is all about. It teaches us that, the, that when we give, we're not supposed to be hanging strings all over, the, over, over whatever it is that we're going to give. Chapter 15, verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you shall make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Okay? Uh, you lend a person money over a period of time. 
Uh, he's trying to pay it back, tries to pay it back, but the seventh year comes around, he has not paid it back. You are required to write it off at that point in time. You may not collect it after that date in the biblical, in God's economy. You're not to have any strings, for example. There comes some place in time where if there are any strings, legally, they are cut, and you can no longer exact the debt. Of a foreigner, you may exact it again. He did allow them to make money off of foreigners in this way, but not off of their own people. He said, That which is with the, yours with your brother, your hand shall release, save when there are no poor among you. For the Lord is going to greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance to possess you. And it, you know, it indicates that there may come a time in a given community where there really aren't any, any poor people that you're directly even involved with. And you're dealing, perhaps, or lending money to somebody that's not poor. Only if you carefully listen to the voice of the Lord your God to observe all these commandments which I uh, com command you this day. For the Lord your God blesses you as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Basically, he means you shall not have to borrow. And look at our nation today. We are the largest debtor nation in the world. Something has gone wrong. He says, If there be among you a poor man, of one of your brethren within any of the gates of, the, of your land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not harden your heart. You shall not shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him. You shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in that, day, that which he wants. Beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you don't give it to him. In other words, he says to you, you're not even allowed to take into consideration when someone comes to you who is poor and needs help, the realization that in a month, 30, mere 30 days from now, they're going to blow the trumpet in the seventh year, and I've got to write this debt off in 30 days. You are not even allowed to even allow that thought to come into your heart. In fact, he says, if you let that thought come into your heart, he says that you're, it is your wicked heart that you have done that. You shouldn't even do it. If he's poor, and if you're helping him because he's poor, you are not supposed to think about that. You are to give it to him. He says, You shall surely give him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because that for this thing the Lord your God shall bless you in all your works and in all that you put your hand to. For the poor will never cease out of the land. I mean, you may not have any right there in your community, but they're always going to be here. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, and to the poor, and to your needy, in the land. Very clear and very plain what you are supposed to do. Elsewhere it tells us that we are not allowed to lend to the poor upon usury. In other words, we are not allowed to take interest from someone who is borrowing because he is poor. Now, it's, there is no biblical prohibition that if one of, the, of us in the church is going into a business proposition and he borrows money from somebody else in the church, shall we say, upon a business proposition of profit-sharing arrangement, there is not a thing in the world if he's going to use your money to make money in him paying you interest upon your money. I really recommend, though, that you don't do that. I recommend if you're going to borrow money for business reasons, go to the bank. Do not borrow uh, from people in the church. It is a source of all sorts of difficulties, problems, and attitudes. shouldn't be, but it is. But if there is a poor person in the church, we are to lend. Odd, isn't it? I caution you about lending to people in the church who don't actually have to have the money. But I tell you, if there are poor people in the church who need the money, by all means, you may never get it back. In fact, Jesus tells you you're not to really even worry about whether you get it back. And you certainly are not supposed to make any money off of lending to the poor in the church. These lessons, I think, are, are clear, and anyone should be able to understand them quite readily. Now, there are some things, however, that take precedence over giving even to the poor and the lessons that are learned in that regard. And I want, to, I want to give you a couple of cautions in that regard. Back in 1 Timothy, chapter 5, a very simple and very straightforward statement, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, the reason I read this is because in ancient times, in, in, in the Bible, there was a, a provision which we have historically called the third tithe. It is, uh, perhaps in biblical terms, better called the tithe of the third year. The Scriptures tell us that in the third year, they were to take 10% uh, 
just like the first tithe, the same amount of money as the first tithe was, 10%, and they were to lay it by them in store in their own, within their own gates in their own city so that the people in their own city, their own area, could come and eat and be filled. It was, in the simplest terms, a form of welfare. It was Bible welfare, and, and very clearly what it was intended to work as. However, it's very evident also of what we have been reading here that it was not the only obligation upon an Israelite as far as helping the poor. And in other words, the third tithe, or the tithe of the third year, was strictly a, a welfare you know, situation in the community. But there was still, in addition to that, the complete obligation to help the poor where you find the poor in times. Now, as I said, over the years, in, in the Worldwide Church of God, the third tithe was taught that it was a third and sixth year in every seven-year cycle, and families had to say that, and it was all sent into headquarters. It wasn't laid up within their gates. It was sent to Pasadena. It was administered centrally out of that area. And there are certain problems, I think, that get involved with that. One difficulty was that, and it finally had to be uh, clarified in the church, that third tithe was for the poor, not from the poor. In other words, if it came down to a situation where a person was, was caught between taking proper care in terms of food and clothing and shelter of his own family and giving to the needs of other poor people, then there was no contest. His first obligation, based upon this scripture, if a man does not provide for his own, especially they, those of his own family, he has denied the faith and he is worse than an infidel. That is not difficult to follow, is it? that the family takes precedence. But you know, in this area of love, which I have already to some measure defined as, as a, a no-strings-attached kind of generosity and a generous feeling, there is something that God has given the family to, to teach this lesson of generosity with your own family that I think sometimes people don't, they, they know about it, but they don't really understand the whys and wherefore. It's called the festival tithe. And it's recorded back in Deuteronomy, the 14th chapter, beginning in verse 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your seed that the field brings forth year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place that he shall choose to put his name there, the tithe of your corn, your wine, your oil, your firstlings, your herds, your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now, this is defined as a different tithe from what we call the first tithe because of its use. This is not to be given to the Levite as the tithe was. This one, this tithe, is to be eaten by you and your family, consumed by you and your family, and it's to be done in such a way as it, you're going to the place where God has chosen to place his name, which is another way of saying you're going to Jerusalem in their time, because that's where the temple was, that's where the Feast of Tabernacles was held, and these are, this is a festival tithe that is for the festival. If the way is too long for you, so you're not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from you, which the Lord your God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall turn it into money, and bind up the money in your hand, and go to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Now, what are you supposed to do with this? Well, you bestow that money for whatever your soul desires, oxen, or sheep, or wine, or strong drink, or whatever you want. And you shall eat there before the Lord your, your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. This is a family affair. Now take a look at that for a minute and think about it. God did not say, I want you to save up enough money so you'll be able to, whatever it is you need to go to the feast, you save that, and you go to the feast and you rejoice, you and your family. He told them to save 10%, a tithe. Now that's kind of interesting in a way because it is bound to leave some people short of what they need, and it's bound to leave other people long on what they need, isn't it? Bound to. In addition to that, for probably the average person in the church or in Israel, what you are doing is you are taking 10% of a year's income and spending it in eight short days, you know, just a little eight-day period. What it translates out to mean is that you can be freer with your family, with your children, with yourself, in your choice of foods, where you might stay or what you might do during this period of time, than you would be able to do otherwise. In other words, it's, a, it, it's to give you something from God. And, and since everything you have is a gift from God, then him telling you this 10%, this is a gift from God for, so that you can bless your family. 
And it goes on to say that if you have even more than they need, it says the Levite that's within your gates, you shall not forget him. And, of course, elsewhere it talks about actually helping the stranger as well. In other words, there are people in the church who need help to go to the feast and have a good time. There are people whose needs are just barely met. It would be nice if someone could just give it to them. And, of course, when you have saved it for that purpose, it's easy to give it for that purpose. The old uh, concept of a, of a poor tithe was not really that strenuous on, upon a person if it was properly understood and spread out over time. The key, especially if it was also understood that you were not to put your own family in poverty while in, in the process of doing it. You were only able to do it if you were able to do it without hurting your family. The effect was, if it were properly done, that you actually laid aside in a special place money that was designated to help the poor. Now, let me ask you this. You've got money that you have said to yourself, or that God has said to you, is not to be used for you. This money that you're going to set aside, what a percentage? Let's say you're going to take a percentage of what you get. It may be 1%, maybe a half a percent, some amount of money. You set that some money aside in a little account somewhere, or a little box or a shoebox or a, uh, a cookie jar. And someone one day you know, comes to you and says, you know, I'm in trouble. I need to borrow some money. Can you help me? What do you need? $50. That's tough. I don't know if I can do that or not. But then you happen to recollect that you actually have got in that cookie jar at home where you've been putting in there $89. You know, you've actually put it in there. Hey, I've got $50. Sure, I'll be glad to help you because I have actually laid aside, you know, when I say tell a person you've done that, but you actually put aside money that was there so that whenever someone did ask you, you would not have to turn them away. Now, the, the, fest, the, the old poor tithe is fulfilled completely, and, and your obligation for it, if you're paying taxes at all, is fulfilled in Social Security and welfare in this country. In fact, those of us who are wage earners in this country are paying considerably more than an Israelite ever paid in third tithe for that purpose. So you don't need that to feel like you have to do a third tithe or anything even like that. But, you know, I really think it would be good for all of us if we had a little fund somewhere that was our own poor fund, so that whenever someone did ask us for something, or we it didn't, maybe didn't ask us, we just found out they needed it. And we were able to say, hey, let me help you with that. And just peel off a couple of $20 bills and give it to the person and not even have to look back. Go home and pull it out of your jar, you know, when you get home. Because you know you actually have put money aside to help the poor. And, of course, if that poor happens to be you, well, then you can take it out of there to help yourself, too, for that matter. Because if your own children are, are doing without something, then you're not doing what's right. You know, God has ways of teaching us things that, that are so important for us to understand. Among them, the festival tithe. Among them, the third tithe, even though it may be fulfilled, in a sense, in, the, in, the, in our governmental system. There is, a, there is a very great loss that takes place there as well. The loss is that it was not God's intent that people, that we should send our money somewhere else and then let an institution help people. He wanted people to help people directly. And that's very important for us to understand. And, of course, there is one more form of giving that takes precedence over all. There is one more love that takes precedence above every kind of love, and that's the love of God. Now, think about it. Do you think it would be right, if it's wrong for you to put strings on a gift that you give to the poor, if it's wrong for you to be stingy when you're taking care of your family, do you suppose it's okay to put strings on what you give to God? Now, in Leviticus 27, there is an interesting little passage which I think bears some thought. This is not a, a scripture that, that really tells us what to do about the tithe and all of its aspects. This is a judgment about one aspect of tithing which reveals something very important to us. It says in verse 30, All the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It doesn't say, by the way, that there's nothing else that you have to tithe on besides agricultural produce. If a man will at all redeem any of his tithes, he shall add the fifth part thereto. Now, what in the world would you want to do that for? Well, you are out in your field, and uh, you've been, been gathering all your stuff together, and you, this particular year you have got an exceptional, an exceptional crop. You really do. 
And one field in particular turned out well, or one orchard turned out gorgeous, and the peaches in that orchard were just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And yet your other orchard over here, the peaches were somewhat less. Now, I would think under most circumstances, a person would take a tenth of the peaches out of this orchard and a tenth of the peaches out of this orchard, and he would take, you know, if he had ten baskets here and ten baskets there, he'd take one basket of each and he would give them over here to God, right? Hmm. We hope so. But all of us have that little larceny in us that might say, well, really, I've got 20 uh, bushels of peaches here. Why don't I give two bushels of peaches out of this vineyard as opposed to both of them? Did you know the Bible says you actually can do that, but you have to add the fifth part to whatever it is that you're changing in terms of fruit and so forth. You might decide that you wanted to keep some of that seed for something else. You may decide that you don't want to give any of the wheat at all or any of the peaches at all. You want to give the monetary value. So what do you do? You give the monetary value plus 20%. Because the whole idea is that you are not supposed to pull anything back from God at all. And God wants that lesson that his offering, his tithe, is not to be any way diminished by human manipulation. You may remember a novel, I think, called God's Little Acre, where this man had set aside one acre of his property that that belonged to God. And whatever cotton was produced on that acre, that belonged to God. And so he, the problem was that that acre turned out to produce the best cotton on the place. So he moved the acre over to here. And then that acre began to produce. And he moved it. Finally, at the end of the book, he has that, the, that one acre where it is now sitting, is on, where his house sits, because his house is right in the middle of it. What cotton grows around there? And wouldn't you know, they finally discovered oil on that acre he had given to God. There is no end to human ingenuity in manipulating offerings and gifts to God to their own benefit if they are so minded to do. But it's not easy to understand, to, 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 and not hard to understand, is it, how wrong that is? And, of course, this makes it very clear. And he says, Concerning the tithe of the herd, of the flock, or even of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That one belongs to God. He shall not search whether it is good or bad. He shall not change it if he changes it at all. Both animals, if he's trying to change it, become holy to God. They belong to God. He cannot play around with it. They shall not be redeemed. These commandments were given to lay all that stuff out for people. You know, it tells us in Proverbs, too, that we are to honor God of the first fruits of all of our increase. In other words, God's is supposed to be the first, not the last of the things. The one exception, of course, being that tenth animal uh, that you give. You don't have ten animals. You can't give a whole animal to God, can you? It's only the tenth one that you were required to give. But as far as fruit was concerned, it was always the first that belonged to God. And it was to be given without a lot of strings attached to it. Now, there are all sorts of strings that come easily to hand when we think about giving. I mean, if you want strings, I'm going to line around. You pick up a string and tie it on there. They're all over the place. One of those that probably is uh, the easiest and probably the most abused is income tax. Because basically, now first of all, let me express this. There is nothing wrong with ordering your affairs to obtain tax benefits from giving. Absolutely nothing wrong with it at all. There is nothing wrong with after you have given, taking it off of your income tax. Nor is there anything wrong with giving in such a way that you actually maximize the returns that you might get from your income tax, such as moving a gift, a gift forward or back over the end of a year because of where it will mean the most to you. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. The problem is that when people sometimes will allow tax considerations to distort their giving patterns, to change their giving patterns, to tug things into a distorted or perhaps even a corrupted perspective. Probably one of the best illustrations of this I have already referred to or alluded to. There is a temptation whenever a situation comes up and there is a poor person and you're going to give him some substantial help. You really want to give him some substantial help. There's a temptation to say, I wonder how I can get this off of my income tax. So what I will do is I will go down here to the church and I will tell the church, look, would you people... Let me give this money to you, and then you give this money to the fellow over here, and I'll be able that way to take it off of my income tax. Okay. Not illegal, I don't suppose, although I'm not exactly sure how the Internal Revenue Service would look at that. Uh, in fact, I think, depending upon the sort of circumstance, it might, might be disallowed. It might even be illegal. Uh, but apart from that, let's consider it just morally. 
or ethically or in your attitude toward God. In the first place, there, you know, if, if the Internal Revenue Service allowed it, there would be nothing criminally or, or necessarily even morally wrong with it. But the reason why God wants us to help one another is so that we come into contact with one another, so that my gift is a gift to you, and that, you know, along with those gifts oftentimes come a certain amount of advice or a certain amount of, of encouragement, a certain amount of interest and care for the person that you're dealing with. A lot of times, in order to somehow make the income tax work, we do things we might not otherwise do. Uh, we do things sometimes for tax reasons rather than because of a love of God. And it's real easy to start putting strings on the things that you're giving to God. And you see, indeed, when you actually give to a poor brother, the Bible tells us you are actually giving to God. And so putting strings on it, uh, putting you know income tax strings on something, is one way we do it. Another that we sometimes, I think, get involved in is or a string that gets involved in this is church politics of one sort or another. I didn't realize how common it is in other churches as well that people will oftentimes, because of the fact that they are a heavy donor, will assume that that gives them certain rights in the decision-making process over things going on. For example, the fact that you donated $2,000 to a church building fund really does not give you the right to select the color of the carpets. It doesn't. It doesn't convey any rights upon you at all. If you are assuming that it does, well, then God somehow has gone right straight out of the picture, hasn't he? He's just gone. just disappeared. You were buying rights. You weren't giving from out of the goodness of and generosity of your heart. If you assume that a donation grants you some kind of control, then you are doing it all wrong. You're hanging strings on what's happening. This type of thing <coughs> happens all the time. It is basically... A, a, just another way of putting strings on. And you see, love, love of your neighbor, love toward the poor, love toward your family, and above all, love toward God, has to be love with no strings attached, or it doesn't mean a thing. Now, all this seems to me also, though, to illustrate something else, and I want you to turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians 8. Because it's a very important concept. I've, I've gone through all this thing about money more from the perspective of trying to help you understand something else that's a little more difficult to understand than money. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. I'm sorry, it's not 1 Corinthians, it's 2 Corinthians 8. I'm messed up on where I am. Moreover, brethren... We want you to know about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. And this was a poor church up there in Macedonia. They, they had very little. In fact, Paul refers to it as deep poverty. He says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. I, I think probably Paul had, or, or those with him had protested about the fact that the Macedonians were so generous that they were probably harming themselves in the process, and it, it almost urged them not to do it, because it says they, they prayed us with much entreaty that we would accept the gift. And he already has told us how, that he considered those people to be in deep poverty. He says, And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave their own selves to God. Now, we all know we have to do that. We all know that we belong to God. We all know we were bought and paid for. We all know that we were you know, redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. We know all these things. And we also know at the same time that we sure try to maintain an awful lot of control over all of ourselves and our lives and the things that we want and the things that we do. And now he talks about giving yourself to God. And indeed, before your giving of your money ever means much of anything. And before you probably will ever come to the place to where you can, will never ever have these twinges or these little strings that you keep wanting to attach to something, you're going to have to learn something somewhere about not putting any strings on your life as it is given to God. No strings attached. It's a sobering concept, and I think a very important one. 
But the way we start learning it, as I said before, I think is told us back in Matthew. Matthew, the 25th chapter. And verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, all these things we would quickly do for Jesus Christ, wouldn't we? If he had no clothes, we would put clothes on him instantly. If we heard he was in prison, we would go to him. If we, Whatever his needs were, we would want to do. And, and the idea of our love for him, a uh, love that calls upon us to give ourselves, certainly would call to give him anything we have, would it not? And these people said, well, uh, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it to me. This is where we start. You say you love God. You think you would like to love him more. You want to learn to give yourself to him without strings attached and without trying to suddenly keep all these controls on your own life. The way that it is done is by giving yourselves to one another and to your brothers and to your sisters and to feed them and to clothe them and to visit them and to care for them with agape, that generous spirit, that love with no strings attached.